What's going on guys? Welcome to my channel. My name is Luxury Ikari and in this video I'm going to be giving you guys a comprehensive guide to console gamers looking to make the switch over to PC. Now I want to preface this video by saying I'm in no way a PC building expert. This is simply based on my own experience and things that I've learned when it comes to building my own PC. There's other videos out there that can also help supplement your research from people who are a lot more reputable than me. But as you can see with my PC right here, I built this thing not too long ago and it actually turned out pretty well. I'll be leaving my uh, specs in the video description below so you can kind of see what I went off of. But generally speaking, I feel like now is a time where a lot of console gamers are going to be looking to make the switch over to PC because especially with the newer generation of consoles coming out, if you see the specs, you can kind of notice that it's not too far behind what you can get out of a mid-level gaming PC today. And also, you know, most of us have been gaming on console for our whole lives. You know, I was a console gamer. I just recently made the Switch. But at a certain point, you just kind of get tired of gaming at 30 FPS and, you know, paying $60 for games that aren't really that optimized, that don't, that don't run poorly, and you're not squeezing the most out of... Um, the visuals and performance that you can get. I mean, you can pay that same amount on PC and then have your experience just completely blown through the roof. I played uh, Destiny 2 on this new PC. I played Jedi Fallen Order. Um, Destiny 2 is capped to 60 FPS, but you can play it maxed out and it looks absolutely amazing. Jedi Fallen Order, um, I run that game at above 60 FPS, max graphics at a 1080p, and it looks absolutely amazing. So I would definitely recommend making a Switch, especially if you're already thinking about it. Now with the market being kind of weird due to a certain virus going around, but it's going to settle down eventually, and then you can start looking for your parts to figure out what you want out of your own gaming rig. So in this video, I'm going to be telling you guys, you know, what goes in the PC, what those parts do, general terminology you might run into, and things that might help supplement your research. So let's go ahead and get started with the video. Also, a bit off topic, but damn, your boy kind of killed that intro, so you got to give me some credit on that one. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, anyways, uh, the main parts you're going to need for a PC or a gaming PC, or PCs in general, you're going to need a CPU, a central processing unit, you're going to need a GPU, a graphics card, or a video card. You're going to need a motherboard. You're going to need a power supply unit. You're going to need your memory. You're going to need storage. And you're going to need a case. And also cooling. Now those are about eight... <laughs> why did I count on my fingers? Those are <laughs> those are eight... Um, those are eight main components you're going to need starting out when it comes to building a PC. Now I'm going to be going over all of these in depth on what they do in a more simplified, simplified manner so you can easily understand them. I'm not going to be as technical with my descriptions, it's just going to be a general idea of what these parts do. So let's go ahead and get started with the next part of the video. Can I get a little drink of water here? <sighs> okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the CPU or the central processing unit. The central processing unit essentially serves as the brain of your computer in a sense that it relays all information throughout the computer. It sends information out and it receives information. The efficiency, the efficiency of your CPU is based on the amount of cores and threads it has. And there's also another unit of measurement called the clock speed, which is measured in gigahertz. Now, for gaming CPUs, you have the Intel and AMD lines, you have the i3, the i5, the i7, and the i9, and with AMD, you have the Ryzen 3, the Ryzen 5, the Ryzen 7, and the Ryzen 9. Each of those different CPUs, they have different things to offer, they have different cores and threads and different processors. Now, in terms of cores and threads, that simply means how efficiently your CPU can run. So lower grade CPUs will have a smaller amount of cores and threads, which affects that CPU's ability to process information and multitask. So if you go for something like a Ryzen 3, it will have a smaller amount of cores and threads, which will mean that it'd be good for gaming, but not much else if you're looking for video editing or streaming applications. In the market now, I would recommend going with an AMD Ryzen line CPU, as they're generally more competitive with their pricing, and they offer sometimes, um, if not on par, better performance than the Intel lines. That can change in the future, who knows, it depends on how each company decides to innovate their products. But generally speaking, if you're looking for light gaming applications, you can go with an i3 or a Ryzen 3. Um, if you're looking for a bit of gaming and streaming and video editing, things of that sort, I will go for a Ryzen 5, or if you're looking for more of a work intensive computer, I will go for a Ryzen 7 or a Ryzen 9. Now, each CPU offers 
uh, different things it brings different things to the table but essentially you know the threes they have a smaller number of cores and threads so the cpu isn't as intensive but it can still run games but it wouldn't really be that good at multitasking unlike the ryzen 5 ryzen 7 or ryzen 9 or you know with the i3 i5 i7 or i9 respectively now, when shopping for CPUs, one thing you'll notice is the amount of lump numbers and letters you'll see. And that'll just be a part with PC parts in general. But each different company uses their own forms of notation. Um, for example, you know, Intel, they have the i3, i5, i7, and i9. And then I run a Ryzen 5 3600. When it comes to the 3, 5, 7, and 9 in front of, you know, i3, Ryzen 3, uh, vice versa, those simply means those are the series. So I run a Ryzen 5 series 3600. And in, in the Ryzen 5 series, you can get the Ryzen 5 3600, you can get the Ryzen 5 2600, you can, you can get the Ryzen 5 1600. There's also other CPUs in there in that line, but just to make it a bit easier to understand, the 5 series in terms of 3600, 2600, and 1600, those are the generations. So I have a Ryzen 5 generation 3 3600. And that's the CPU that I run in my PC. The next thing I want to talk about are GPUs or graphics processing units. The graphics processing unit in your PC is essentially what you would equate to being your eyes. So while the CPU can figure out if those games are compatible with your PC, it imagines those files and things of that matter. But the GPU is what projects it onto your screen, is what you see in terms of pixels, colors, and frame rates. Now, depending on what, C or what GPU you get, that depends on how clear your picture is. So for a like a top quality 4K picture, then you're gonna have to chill out a bit more cash for a higher end GPU. But for me, I run a 1660 Super at um, 1080p on my PC, and it can run it can run pretty much anything at 60 FPS or above. I can run Destiny 2. It's capped at 60 FPS, but 60 FPS looks amazing. And for Jedi Fallen Order, I can run that game at max graphics, and it runs at about 60 to 70 FPS. Or if I turn it to high graphics or medium graphics, I can run it at around like 80 to 90 FPS, or even above 100 FPS at certain in certain points in the game. But essentially speaking, 60 FPS is is good. That's like the perfect medium for uh, gaming. Now, that's strictly for gaming in 1080p. Now, if I were to switch my resolution up to 1440p, then the 1660 Super would have a bit of a problem. But I don't plan on doing that. I plan on staying at 1080p for a while. But if you want to game at 1440p or 4K, then you're definitely going to have to get a more expensive graphics card. Now, one thing to look into is benchmarking. Benchmarking is when someone takes graphics cards and they, they compare them against each other um, by running uh, different games on them. So you can kind of gauge, you know, the, the frames per second each GPU has to offer and what quality is and what you're getting for the money you're paying for. Now, if you're just looking for 1080p gaming and you're trying to look for frame rates at 60 FPS, 60 FPS or above, the 1660 Super or the 1660 Ti is the best option for you because it offers the most competitive price compared to other GPUs in that same range on the market. And typically speaking, when it comes to GPUs, a lot of the times when, they, when it comes to the frame rate, I feel like that's more about future-proofing your GPUs, so you might not have to upgrade um, more down the line. So with my 1660 Super, I'll be fine at 1080p. Um, if I choose to upgrade, the only thing I'll upgrade would be my GPU, so it will be significantly less than building an entirely new computer. But that's just dependent on what you get. Um, you can also get a 2060, a 2070, or 2080 which I feel like would be a bit overkill for 1080p gaming, but if you're gaming at 1440p, those are good options as well, or 4K even. So it just depends on what you want. I will look into different GPUs. Of course, um, graphics cards evolve over time, so there's gonna be different lines that come out in the future which offer different performance specs. But depending on when you watch this video and when you decide to build your PC, just look into uh, common GPUs used and look at benchmarks for those GPUs and compare them to what you want out of your own PC. I was gonna make a joke about GPUs being like eyes and Naruto, so like if you want to just have regular human eyes, just get like a bunch of GPU, but if you want to have like the, the Itachi uh, Uchiha Mangekyo Sharingan or whatever, you pay like a thousand for a 2080 Ti or something like that. <laughs> the next thing I want to talk about is the motherboard. The motherboard is essentially the foundation of your computer. It is essentially just a blank slate which has you know these pins and connectors which allows electrical energy to travel and circuit through to the other parts of the PC. It's what your CPU uses to relay and send out information as well 
It also has, you know, various amounts of slots and things of that matter so you can plug all your PC components into the motherboard because everything plugs into the motherboard to be able to function. So without a motherboard, you wouldn't be able to have a computer. A lot of the ways motherboards differ is in their form factors and their features. Form factors meaning typically the size, so you have the micro ITX which is for if you want a more compact portable build or if you just want a minimal sleek design. You have the micro ATX which is the common form factor a lot of PC gamers use because it just offers just the right amount of slots and things that matter for you to plug all your parts into. And you have the just the regular ATX which is the biggest form factor for the motherboards which typically offer more features in the motherboard itself so you might have more slots for installing your memory, you might have more slots for installing your graphics cards and things of that matter. So if you're trying to run a more you know expensive you know powerful build that runs multiple graphics cards and things of that matter then the regular ATX would be good for you, but typically speaking, if you're just a console gamer coming over to PC looking to make a switch, then you would do a lot better with getting a micro ATX, as they aren't too hard to understand and the parts fit in them nicely and you have just the perfect amount of space to be able to fit it into a case. Now when shopping for motherboards, things you want to take note of is the fact that depending on if you have an AMD CPU or an Intel CPU, different motherboards are going to be compatible with those. Now, I use an AMD CPU, so the motherboard I have is a B450. Um, a B450 motherboard is a good budget option for um, beginners looking to make the switch over to PC. It offers just all the, all the basic amenities that you need to be able to get started. Now, if you're more of an enthusiast, then you might want to look into getting an X470 or an X570 format motherboard because it, they offer you know, better support when it comes to things like overclocking and things of that matter. So, but just starting out, I will look into getting a B450, or if you want another one, it just depends on the type of research you do and what you're looking for out of your PC. I'm gonna get another drink of water here before we go on to the next part of the video. Everyone out there should be drinking water, man. Your health is very important. You can't just be sitting on the game all day, man. You gotta take care of yourself. Okay, so the next session of this video, we're gonna go over memory or RAM, or random access memory. Random access memory serves as, I guess, you can say your computer's energy, or the energy in your body that you need to perform tasks. Um, in a way to explain that, what I mean is every program you run on your PC uses a certain amount of energy, or RAM. Now, you wanna make sure you have enough RAM in your PC so your computer can do those uh, things properly. So if I'm running you know, a video game on my PC along with OBS, while also having Discord or Google Chrome and things like that. Each one of those things take a different amount of RAM and you want to make sure you have enough so you can run all the programs you need to run without your computer slowing down. It's like how many groceries can you put in the bag before that bag starts to break or get heavy. Now when shopping for RAM, you can usually get it in, a, in increments so you can get 8 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes, and 128 gigabytes. I think you can get 64 gigabytes, but I'm not entirely sure. But in terms of if you're trying to figure out which one is right for you, if you're just doing some gaming and things of that matter, or if you if you just ha if you're on a bit of a budget, then I'll recommend getting eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, but typically, you have to know that games nowadays and games in the future they're going to require more out of your computers than they would in the, in the past. So typical RAM values are going to go up. So I have 16 gigabytes of RAM which is at 32 megahertz. Megahertz, again, is also a measurement of speed, which is how fast your RAM is. But 16 gigabytes is a good sweet spot for if you're looking for gaming and streaming, or just gaming in general, because games are typically going to take up more RAM, and depending on what applications you run, things of that matter. So um, you can get 16 gigabytes is a good sweet spot, 8 gigabytes if you're on a budget, or if you're trying to have more of a workload computer, if you're going to be running, you know, more editing software, things of that matter, you now will go for 32 gigabytes to um, 128 gigabytes. 32 gigabytes is really good if you're trying to do heavy streaming or like heavy content creation and things of that matter. But typically, starting out, 16 gigabytes is the perfect sweet spot. Also, one last thing to take note of when you're shopping for RAM is looking on whether or not it's DDR3, DDR4, or DDR5. Um, most gaming computers nowadays in 2020 um, support DDR4 or DDR5 uh, RAM uh, that, and that's entirely dependent on your motherboard so you want to check with your motherboard 
in the descriptions of, of, the, of the shopping sections or whatever website you're using, and it will tell you if that motherboard supports DDR4, DDR5, or, DDR, or DDR3 uh, RAM, and it will also tell you what values of speed that they support. So me, I run, again, 16 gigabytes of RAM at 3200 megahertz, and my motherboard supports that, so I'm able to use that in my motherboard and not have any problems. So check your compatibility with all your parts and if they can fit into your motherboard. Alright, and the next thing we're going to talk about is storage. Now, I feel like storage is pretty self-explanatory. Most gamers know what storage is. If you play on a PS4 or Xbox or anything, you know that's, you know, your hard drive, you know, that's where your games go after they're installed and things of that matter. But, in terms of PC, there's, you have more accessibility to different types of storage you can get. So, you have your HDDs or your hard drives, which are typically, um, they're more of a budget option. They don't go as fast as the other option I'm about to tell you. But you can get more space in a hard drive for less money, but your games will load, you know, a bit slower than you would with the other type of memory or storage, I'm sorry, which is an SSD or a solid state drive. Solid state drives are a bit more expensive than HDDs, but they load a lot faster. You can put games on an SSD or programs on an SSD and they can load almost instantly depending on what you use. Now, you can have a PC where you have SSDs and HDDs. Um, a lot of people have setups where they'll have maybe 250 gigabytes of SSD to put their OS on and maybe, you know, two of their favorite games or so and then put the rest of the games they don't use on their HDD. But it's entirely up to you. You can also get, you know, you can get 500 gigabytes of SSD or even one tetrabyte or two tetrabyte. Or you can just have a complete HDD system if you don't really care too much about loading times. That's really up to you. But things you want to check when shopping for an SSD or an HDD is you want to check the compatibility with the motherboard. A lot of motherboards have M2 slots and um, an SSD can fit into an M2 slot, but they can also fit into a SATA slot. In motherboards, they will also have some, some ports where you can put you know, your storage into a SATA slot as well. But you just want to check and make sure what slot your storage is fitting into when it comes to building your PC. Alright, next we got the power supply in it. The power supply unit isn't really that hard to explain. I'm saving the easy parts for last. <laughs> but uh, the power supply unit is like the heart of your computer. And it's, it essentially serves the same function as your heart would serve. You know how your heart pumps blood to help you know the rest of your body work? That's what the power supply does, except it's in, you know, it's in wattage. You put the power supply in your PC, and your power supply plugs up to the motherboard. The power supply is what sends, the, sends that energy throughout the motherboard to be able to power up your other PC parts. So it's pretty much an, it's an AC adapter. It's what plugs into the wall. It's what gives your computer power. <clears throat> now, things to take note of when it comes to your power supply is um, you might see things like the 80 plus rating, the wattage, or the um, if it's modular, semi-modular, or non-modular. Now, when it comes to wattage, that's simply how much power your power supply needs to be able to um, help your computer function properly without shorting out. So depending on all the PC parts you have, they all have a certain number of energy that they take to be able to power, and they're all going to draw energy from that power supply. So you want to make sure you have enough wattage in your power supply to be able to um, support the parts you have in your PC. In terms of 80 plus rating, that's a rating that power supplies get to measure their efficiency, efficiency when it comes to energy use. And you have regular 80 plus rating, you have 80 plus bronze, you have 80 plus gold, and 80 plus platinum. And again, like I said, it's simply just how efficient your power supply is at drawing energy. So for example, I'm just going to make up a number. You might have a bronze power supply that's efficient at drawing around 84% of your power supply's energy. Or you might have a gold power supply that's efficient at drawing around 86% of your power supply's energy. Or you might have a platinum power supply that's efficient at drawing around 90% to like 100% of your power supply's energy. Now those are just numbers I made up. The figures might be a bit close to that, but essentially that's what the 80 plus rating is. Now. In terms of when it comes to if your power supply is modular, semi-modular, or non-modular, modular power supplies simply means that everything, and when it comes to cores and things of that matter, you can take out and plug into your power supply. So when it comes to things you don't need to be plugged in, you don't have to worry about taking up a lot of space. You can just unplug those from your power supply and then you'll be all good. Semi-modular power supplies mean that all the cords, all the essential things you need are just automatically plugged into the power supply. You can't take them out. 
and non-modular means all the cores are just into your power supply so you might have things you don't need it's just gonna have to figure out a way to kind of put them to the side and have it do a bit more cable management now the difference in those is simply down to price but i would recommend getting a semi-modular or modular power supply just to make the job a little bit cleaner and easier for you especially if you're just starting out building a pc and also this is very important do not cheap out on your power supply because if your power supply goes out the wrong way your whole computer is going to get fried <laughs> But uh, it's important to look at reputable brands when it comes to power supplies so you know what you're getting. Don't get tricked into power supplies advertising those like RGB and all this stuff. No, you just want to get you a good power supply that's going to power your computer and not mess it up. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is the case. So we have all the basic components we need to build a PC. We have the CPU, the GPU, the motherboard, the power supply, memory, and storage. Now the case is very important because you're going to need something to put all those parts in. Now you could go without a case, but I wouldn't recommend that just starting out. I mean some people, they literally have their setup where they, they have the motherboard and everything plugged into it and just have, have it dangling from the roof of the wires. <laughs> I've seen some people put it into like a, a pizza box. It's a, it's a bunch of wacky stuff. So I mean I would recommend looking up some funny PC builds and things of that matter. But in terms of starting out, you're definitely not a professional. Just go with a regular PC case. Now, the way PC cases differ is um, you want to make sure your case can fit the form factor of the motherboard you decided on. So if you have a micro ITX motherboard, you want to make sure you get a case that supports a micro ITX motherboard. And same with the other uh, motherboards and form factors and things of that matter. Cases also differ and some of them offer RGB, some of them offer, you know, different spots in which you can place, you know, part, the parts of your computer. Um, it's really just a matter of preference is what I'm trying to say. You know, store, cases can be aesthetically pleasing. Some of them have fiberglass fronts. Some of them have um, acrylic. So, the, but the main thing you want to look for in a case is just make sure it fits your form factor um, and make sure you see that the case has, you know, everything you need out of a case. You know, certain cases have certain USB slots in certain places. And the last thing we want to talk about when building your PC is cooling. Now, I kind of touched on this when I was talking about the case, but cooling is essentially, um, pretty much what you do is to keep your parts from overheating is actually very very important so certain like I said before certain cases might come with fans and depending on how those fans are um, set in the case they can be intake fans or exhaust fans intake fans or it brings in cool air to cool your PC components and exhaust fans it pushes out the hot air that your uh, PC components produce so your parts aren't being like baked in heat or whatever so if you're running more intensive programs and things of that matter, you want to make sure you have a good amount of fans in your uh, in your case so your parts don't overheat. One of the more important parts that you don't want to overheat is a CPU, which is why a lot of CPUs will automatically come with a stock cooler. But it's typically good to buy an aftermarket cooler because aftermarket coolers offer you know better cooling capabilities. So you just want to do a little bit of research on what type of fan you want to get. Uh, in terms of cooling your CPU, you can just get a regular um, CPU fan to cool your CPU. Or if you want extra cooling, you can go with liquid cooling, which cools your CPU um, a bit better than the normal cooler would. But in terms of fans, um, it typically don't really matter what kind of fans you get. You just want to make sure they fit in the case. Because at the end of the day, as long as you have some kind of cool air going to your PC parts, then you should be fine. Okay, so that's pretty much it for building a PC. Those are all the major components you need. Now, one last thing I want to talk about is the monitor. The monitor is also important when it comes to building your PC because if you have a crappy monitor and you have a good setup, then you won't actually be able to see that. What I mean by that is um, you want if you're gaming at 1080p, you want to make sure you have a, a monitor that supports 1080p, 1440p, 4K, and whatever res resolution you want to game at, you want to make sure your monitor supports that. Also, one other thing to take note of is the is the refresh rate, which means that, um, say for instance, you have a monitor with a refresh rate of 60 megahertz. If you have a monitor with a refresh rate of 60 megahertz and your graphics card is outputting frames above 60 megahertz, then you won't be able to see those frames and it will actually lead to visual problems in your monitor. So one way to circumvent that is if you go into games you're playing and you cap off the frame, if you cap off the frame rate at 60, then your monitor will be fine if it's a 60 uh, megahertz refresh monitor. Now, you can also get monitors with higher refresh rates, that way you can actually see the higher frames. So I have a monitor with 144 uh, hertz, that's the refresh rate on that, and if that means if my graphics card pushes out you know, frames up to that amount, then I won't have any visual problems and I'll be fine. 
So you want to make sure you have a decent refresh rate on your monitor. You want to make sure your monitor supports the resolution you're trying to game at. And you want to make sure your monitor has um, a, a good, nice, low amount of input lag. My monitor has only one millisecond of uh, input lag, so that's just extremely good for gaming. But typically for gaming, you want to make sure your monitor has no more than, I want to say, two or three milliseconds of input lag. But just do some shopping around, and I'm sure you'll find something for you. In terms of other peripherals, when it comes to keyboard and mouse, you want to make sure your keyboard is a mechanical keyboard if you can. If not, then it's fine. But when it comes to looking for mouses, you know, it also depends on how the mouse fits in your hand. It also depends on the mouse's DPI, which means it's pretty much how sensitive your mouse is to your movements. And you can also tune that in the mouse's settings. But you also want to get nice speakers. And one other thing I want to let you guys know is to use PC Part Picker. PC Part Picker is essential when it comes to building PCs because you can list all the parts you want to put in your PC and essentially build it on that website. And that website will tell you if the parts are compatible with each other. It would also tell you the wattage that you need for your power supply so you don't have to look all over the internet trying to calculate what you need. Now, along with PC Part Picker, um, sometimes it may say parts are incompatible, but that might be just because they haven't updated. So if it says a part is incompatible, I'll go ahead and do extra research on that and see if other people have uh, tested the compatibility. So, for instance, um, with a lot of motherboards with a Ryzen uh, Generation 3, um, some, of, some uh, motherboards wouldn't be compatible with the CPU uh, chipset, and so you did what you would call a BIOS update. But... Some manufacturers automatically put the BIOS update on the motherboard before they ship them out, so you wouldn't have to worry about that. But in a lot of cases, PC Park Picker, they don't really, they haven't really updated that, so it might still tell you that your motherboard is incompatible with your CPU, even though it is. So if it says that, I would just do a little bit of extra research and see if your CPU is actually compatible with your motherboard. But that's pretty much it, guys. I want to thank you for watching the video. If you like the video, then make sure you like it, comment what you think, subscribe. I'm going to be posting more content on this channel, as I'm going to be mostly a gaming channel, but, you know, just chill vibes in general. I'm just going to be posting stuff on here, but I'm also going to be streaming on Twitch. Um, I'm learning how to use OBS, and I want to have that set up soon. But, yeah, if you guys like the video, again, just like, comment, subscribe. I'm going to be posting more videos on this channel, and thank you for watching. Je sais qu'il n'y a pas